Hello, Chris. You are muted. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, good evening, uh, good evening, uh, Chief. Uh, Chris, uh, you are muted. Can we check your audio, audio please, Chris? Yeah, now it's. Uh... Yeah, but I'm not able to hear him. Are you able to hear Chris? No, no, no. No, sir. Not it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah fine, fine. Super. Yes. Okay, mm. good. Good evening. Good morning, Dr. Chris. Dr. Ramadan. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Oh. Good evening for you, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We just had our Thanksgiving celebration yesterday. Oh, super. Wonderful. So you had a good time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's nice. Uh, you were saying that you will be in your friend's place. Are you in your place or? Oh, I'm in. I'm at home. We decided to come home instead of staying there. So, okay. I'm in my I'm in my study at home. Okay. <laughs> we still have 15 minutes, but it's nice to get connected because. Sometimes we just don't know what happens. Sure, I understand that. Yeah, and then all I do is hit my share screen. Correct. Uh, yeah, when my talk. Yeah, yeah. We we want to try it now. Yeah, let's try it now just to make sure. Yeah. Is that working? Oh yeah, fine. Very nice. Super. And then I will hit uh, stop share. Okay, perfect. So just to give you uh, a brief, uh, Chris, this is this is a, 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 the entire state meeting. This is not just an Arabic meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, who is our advisor at Aravind and who was our chief medical officer at Aravind Thirnal Veli is now the president of the association. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. And Thank he's you. A, he's a very Thank close you. friend of Alan Robin. Oh, okay, great. So we they have... were first trained by Spate only in 89. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, at Wills. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a small world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Praja, do you do you go to all the other locations or do you spend most of the time just at in Ar at Aravind? Uh, most of the time I'm in Madurai, but then if yeah. it's some administrative meeting, I'm also the finance director for the entire Aravind I care system. So uh -huh. that would envision me traveling a bit. Uh, but then we now have 13 locations. So even if you just go to one place a month, it takes a year yeah. to go go on. Uh, but but the Zoom things are really good, even for our internal discussions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So well, yes. Are you only in the one state? Uh, almost ninety five percent. We just opened our, our first uh, hospital outside our state in a state called Andhra Pradesh, in a place called Tirupati. Mm -hmm. Mostly, mostly in Tamil Nadu. Yes. How is the weather there now? Actually, weather's getting cold in Philadelphia. Okay. Today it's today it's cold and rainy. Oh. Yesterday, yesterday was cold and nice. Cold being it was probably fifty degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. That, that's maybe cold by Philadelphia standard, but but it's not really cold by American. Not standard. really cold. Well, in in two months it'll get down to twenty degrees. Fahrenheit. That gets that gets cold. <laughs> that gets cold. Yeah. It, it's interesting, you know. Uh, you, you you might have had so many publications and so many things, but when people just know that you were another person who started Will Sai Manual, they go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 
That's true. That's um, my big claim to fame. So that's, I have also written an, a, a question answer exam. I have written three textbooks. I'm not popular for that, but I've just uh, created a, a question answer book for passing in uh -huh. the exam. And that is, that is what made me popular, more popular. Yeah. The questions and answers, that's the way the young generation, the current generation studies. Yes. They don't really want textbooks anymore. They just want questions and answers. That's right. That's what we're finding out in the, at the Academy of Ophthalmology in our education division. So Dr. RK, do you want us to mute ourselves when you are going to speak? And then we, we open up since yeah, we we buy, yeah. seven. We will meet all of us, uh, meet and uh, only I will speak for some time. And yeah, since we all have uh, we have checked our videos and these things, so I'll keep my audio muted even now. Chris also can do the same, and then we will open up when you hand over the podium to us. Not yeah, yes. I think Nirmal Sir, line Sir, 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 I think nice to see you so active and uh, this thing in the association. I've always been very proud of how energetic you are. You, Thank you, and LRO, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, a um, few uh, of our committee members are uh, in the attendees list. Uh, what is the procedure to move them to this page, sir? Send your link. Uh, faculty link. You can send your link. Oh, okay, I'll send it, sir. Thank you, oh, yeah. sir. Yeah, yeah. Jayden. Either prison or the character of thing, Good, very good. Ain't then a super sincere pigeon. Ain't then a super sincere pigeon. I will love and the actor of a shock consultant and the neck may not a pigeon smurda. Yeah, yes, yes. I'm so proud of that. Somebody is there in Madurai, no? Mighty. Sir, good evening, sir. Sir, pray with sir. Hello. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, check for IT. Yaar, yaar, yaar. Yeah, check for IT. 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 Yeah, check Uh, Balaji, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening, Balaji. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, good evening.
Yes. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Prasanna. Sir, uh, the link was not working, sir. I was trying for the last 10 minutes, sir. Yeah, why? It's the same link we are using, no? Yeah. Now, after Jainthan, sir, sent a link, it actually works, sir. Oh, yeah. Okay. I will find out. Uh -huh. yes, the sir. same link for all uh, the yes sir. yes, sir. Good evening, no, Prasanna, sir. Okay. Email, email link to have mm, Yeah. Email link is working. I think I'm going to PDF later now. Email link is working. Mm -hmm. Nirmal, sir, or condolence meeting, sir. So, 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, 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 you told me. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. More yes, sir. Rajan, Shall we start, Prajan? Yes, Chris. Yes. Yeah. Uh, dear uh, uh, Dr. Chris, the guest speaker of the today session, uh, Dr. Prajana, Dr. Ratik, Dr. Jaindan, Dr. Prasanna, Dr. Balaji, and other office bearers of uh, TNYA, and my dear colleagues. Uh, good evening to all of you and good morning to Dr. Christopher Rapino. I uh, really, it's a very happy moment to have uh, uh, Dr. Christopher among with us. And uh, he's a very busy practitioner and uh, he's one of the top most uh, person in the cornea. And he has done a lot of work in various uh, cardiac diseases and his complications are so neat. And immediately he has accepted uh, our request to give his talk today. And of course, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association is one of the oldest associations in our country. And we are having nearly about 4,000 uh, members in our association. And we used to conduct various academic activities every month and uh, by doing various webinars uh, in various specialties. And uh, every month we used to have uh, one uh, guest speaker, international guest speaker to talk about uh, something uh, a, a different uh, topic. So last month we had uh, Dr. Alan Robbins, 
So this month, uh, of course, you yourself, Dr. Chris, you yourself, Dr. Chris. And next month, we have David Chang and something like that every month. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm really very, uh, on behalf of TNYA, this Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association, we extend a warm welcome to Dr. Christopher Rapino. And uh, it's juncture, I have to thank uh, uh, Dr. Prajana for uh, making it to happen. Once immediately, when I, when I uh, did such with him, uh, I want to have a cardiac person. Immediately, he mentioned your name only. I can ask Chris because he's one of the best, uh, topmost person and uh, he's up person to talk to our forum. So in that way, you, know, you also immediately agreed uh, for our request. So I have to thank both of you, Dr. Prajana and uh, Chris. And Prajana has taken a lot of uh, train uh, to organize in a systematic way. He wants everything to be in a systematic way. So for morning itself, he was doing so much of homework for, uh, to make this uh, uh, session as uh, one of the best sessions so that it would be useful for uh, most of the ophthalmologists, uh, but for young postgraduates, fellows, and also for the practicing ophthalmologists. In that way, the topic you have selected is a wonderful topic with uh, so much of uh, advancement that the topic that uh, repeats infection of the eye. Yes, uh, so many changes are happening in the field of uh, viral infections of the eye. And of course, I cannot forget to will say hospital in my life because I had my first uh, glaucoma training in 1989. I don't know how many more of you would have not bought that uh, time. And with the doctor space, so such a still I am having a very good contact with him. Even this uh, March, they have uh, alumni day. They, they have an invitation. I don't know whether I will be able to attend or not. But anyway, it's a wonderful person, Dr. Spade and the other people. And of course, Chris, I heard from Prajana a lot about you. I'm really very happy to welcome on behalf of Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association for this today uh, guest lecture. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh, Dr. Atik, you want to say a few words? Atik? Uh, sir, a heartfelt uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Christopher for having accepted uh, our Prajna sir's invite. Uh, it's an honor and uh, a privilege uh, to have uh, uh, someone of your caliber to uh, deliver uh, your uh, uh, talk to us. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, sincere thanks to Prajna sir uh, for all the efforts for having uh, invited uh, Christopher, sir, uh, to uh, deliver this lecture. I don't want to waste much time. Uh, over to uh, Prajna, sir, to take it forward, please. Yes. Well, <clears throat> respected president of the Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association and uh, the office bearers and uh, my dear colleagues, it gives me immense pleasure today to introduce one of the doyens of ophthalmology, Dr. Christopher Rapuano to this audience. Dr. Rapuano is currently the director of the cornea service at the world famous Wills Eye Hospital. He's a professor of ophthalmology at the Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University at Philadelphia. Dr. Rapuano joined the cornea service at Wills Eye Hospital in 1991 after his fellowship with Dr. Kratchmer at the University of Iowa. And he did his residency at Wills Eye and Medical School. During his ophthalmology residency, Dr. Rapuano co-authored a best-selling textbook in ophthalmology, the Wills Eye Manual. Most of us have seen and read the Wills Eye Manual and we can be very proud to say that Dr. Christopher Rapuano was one of the founding authors of this very famous Will's Eye Manual, which is famous even to this day. He has published several books, numerous book chapters, and over 250 articles in the peer-reviewed literature on corneal diseases, refractive surgery, and excimer laser PTK surgery. He is also the series editor for once again, a very famous book, the Will's Eye Color Atlas series, which is in its third edition. Dr. Rapuano has served on many committees of the American Academy, including chairing the Cornea Preferred Practice Patterns Committee. 
He is currently a member of the AO Board of Trustees. He is the AO's Senior Secretary for Clinical Education and oversees over a dozen committees, including the BCSC course, the famous BCSC course of the AO, the OCAP, the Resident Education, the One Network, and the INET. He received the Achievement Award, Senior Achievement Award, Life Achievement Honor Award, and the Secretariat Award four times from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He's on the board of Ophthalmic Mutual Insurance Company. He's on the editorial boards of several peer-reviewed ophthalmology journals, including Cornea, AJO Case Reports, Eye, and Contact Lens, and was the editor-in-chief of the yearbook of ophthalmology for over 10 years. He's a past president of the Cornea Society. I have great pleasure today, and it's my honor to invite Professor Christopher Rapuano to talk to us on one of the most important subjects in which he has contributed so much to the global literature. The topic today will be the management of herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus anterior segment disease. Over to you, Dr. Rapuano, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak to our esteemed society members today. Well, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um, I've known Prajna for many years, and when he asked me to speak, I, I was more than happy to. Um, Dr. Ramakrishnan, I started my residency at Wills in 1987. So we were there together for a short period of time. <laughs> well, again, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen now, and I'm gonna talk for about of 50 minutes, give or take, and I'm more than happy to take questions at the end. Okay. Is the screen share working? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Um, so the topic today is management of herpes simplex and varicella virus anterior segment disease. Yes. Can you go to the uh, slide show? How's that? Yes, this is perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. I do work with several companies. Um, the only ones that are uh, uh, applicable today are Biotissue makes Procara and Dompe makes Oxervate. So herpes simplex, as we all know, is one of the most common infectious causes of decreased vision, at least in North America, and I suspect in many areas around the world. Humans are the only natural host for HSV comes in type one and type two. Type one typically causes the ocular and facial herpes, whereas type two typically causes the genital herpes. And at least in the US population, 75 to 90%, depending on the study, has antibodies to HSV-1. In other words, has been infected with HSV type one. The primary infection usually occurs during childhood and may appear as a cold or a flu, Typically, there are no skin blisters, but you can have skin blisters um, or other eye findings with a primary episode, but usually not. And these episodes resolve without treatment. Having said that, the virus then remains dormant in the trigeminal ganglion and then can reactivate years later. This is a patient of my senior partner, Peter Leibson's from many years ago, a child with a primary HSV infection, and here you can see the skin lesions in both eyes. As I just mentioned, most of the ocular HSV infections that we see in practice, in clinical practice, are recurrences. We're not typically seeing these primary infections. And the triggers of recurrences are generally unknown. Uh, we suspect that there are triggers, for example, sunlight or stress or things like that, but when studies have been done, it's pretty hard to actually pinpoint direct triggers for HSV recurrences. I'm gonna go through kind of the anterior segment findings. For the eyelids, it can cause blisters. On the conjunctiva, it can cause a follicular conjunctivitis. And you can get actually a dendritic conjunctivitis, dendritic ulcer of the conjunctiva, but these dendrites on the conjunctiva do not look like classic dendrites. I'll show a picture in a few minutes. 
So here's a patient of mine um, who has like, actually skin lesions in both eyes from herpes simplex, and she has had herpes simplex keratitis and dermatitis in both eyes over the years. Um, here is a skin lesion in another patient um, that's resolving, and you can see almost that it has a little dendritic pattern to it in the skin. So you can kind of think of that as a little bit of a dendrite in the skin, but they certainly do not always look like dendrites on the skin. And here are two different lesions. These are ulcerated HSV lesions of the eyelids. Um, here, you know, a kind of a, a depressed ulceration. Here, kind of an elevated ulceration of the eyelids. And this is a kind of a limbal or almost conjunctival dendrite um, in a patient with a history of herpes simplex keratitis. And you can see here, it's not it's certainly not a classic dendrite that you see on the cornea, but it could imagine that's a little bit of a, a dendritiform pattern there. So on the cons, they are not classic dendrites. Now, what we do see is, is, is a lot of the problems come in the cornea. And this ranges from an epithelial keratitis, SPK, to a classic dendrite, to a geographic dendritic keratitis, and then immune stromal keratitis, discoform keratitis, necrotizing keratitis, and then a neurotrophic keratitis or keratopathy. And I'll go through those. We talked a little bit about iritis. I will not talk about HSV retinitis today. So when you have a dendritic or geographic keratitis, this is active viral infection in the cornea. Um, so it's active, you know, literally replicating virus in the cornea, active corneal infection. And here's just a picture of a classic dendrite with this kind of tree branching patterns, terminal end bulbs. No one would miss this as a classic dendrite. This is a uh, picture from my senior partner, Peter Lapson, again, with multiple small dendrites stained with rose bengal. There's another uh, dendrite. You can see it's dendritic pattern over here, and it's widening. The infection is getting worse, and there's it becomes a geographic dendrite where there's an epithelial defect here, and then the staining elevated um, uh, a pattern um, at the outside edge. And here is an unfortunate patient of mine who has herpes dendrites in both eyes at the same time. Here's more of a classic, um, relatively early dendrite. And here's more of a geographic dendrite where it's actually expanding and getting worse. And this is a patient with a dendrite centrally and also some inflammatory reaction. So it has KP there. And there we get a picture of the dendrite with the fluorescein staining. And here is another large dendrite um, that's, that's enlarging and becoming a geographic ulcer. And here's a very large dendrite in a patient who had a penetrating keratoplasty for herpes simplex, and unfortunately has a large recurrent geographic dendrite here. And it's a little bit hard to see without fluorescein staining, but you can see these elevated grayish epithelial thickened edges here. And with fluorescein staining, you can see these classic dendritic edges. I like this picture because it looks a bit like a dragon to me. Not that one would want to have that on their own cornea. So how do we treat dendritic keratitis? Well, since it's an active uh, replicating viral infection, we treat it with antivirals, typically with oral antivirals, such as acyclovir 400 milligrams five times a day, or you can use valacyclovir or famcyclovir, or we treat it with topical antivirals. Um, in the US, we use gancyclovir gel, typically five times a day. You can also use acyclovir ointment five times a day, or trifluridine drops. In the US, it's nine times a day. In other countries, it seems to be five times a day. Trifluridine drops are much more toxic than the gancyclovir or acyclovir. And then when someone has a dendrite, I follow them up in three days to a week, depending on how bad it is and how their symptoms are, just to make sure things are improving. If they're improving at a week, I cut their medicines in half, and then I stop their topical or, and, or oral medications at two weeks. So the infection really should be gone at two weeks. After two weeks, it's resolved but they may have some residual staining. And the residual staining is often from toxicity rather than from active viral infection. And the mistake that a lot of 
uh, ophthalmologists in the U.S. make or optometrists in the U.S. make is they see the staining at two weeks and they think, oh my goodness, there's, air, there's active infection going on. I need to keep them on their toxic, you know, trifluoridine medication. And they keep them on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the staining gets worse and worse. And they think there's active infection, where in reality, there, was, there wasn't any infection after two weeks. It was just all toxicity. So those patients, we stop the medications and often their staining will get better. You can get resistance to these antivirals, but resistance is pretty uncommon. And after a dendrite goes away, you can often see a little bit of this stromal haze there. Peter Lapson used to call this a ghost dendrite. And here's a patient I saw not that long ago with an active dendrite right through the visual axis. Um, in the top left, it's without fluorescein staining. And then in the bottom right, it's with fluorescein staining. Again, a classic dendrite with the terminal end bulbs there. And with treatment a week later, uh, the staining has gone away completely. But you see this kind of stromal uh, haziness, stromal hazy keratitis pattern. And a month later, it is resolving. At this point, it can be treated with steroids to help it to go away. Now, the next type of cornea problem you see with herpes simplex is an immune stromal keratitis. Now, as opposed to a dendritic keratitis, which is an active replicating viral infection in the cornea, this immune stromal keratitis is thought to be an inflammatory reaction in the stroma, not an infection. And you have a mild, the mild haze after a dendrite is one form of this, but you could also get a more diffuse form of a stromal infiltrate or stromal whitening, and it may have an immune ring, it may be there for a while and bring in corneal neovascularization, and that can bring in lipid deposition. And because it's inflammatory, they may have an anterior chamber reaction with that too. So here is have an ant, a, a stromal keratitis that's actually been there for a little while, and it's hard to see, but there are neovascular vessels here with some lipid deposition, and there you can see that a little bit better. There's another prior stromal keratitis with neovascular addition and lipid deposition and significant kind of stromal thinning that occurred there. Another form is a discoform endotheliitis. And this is an inflammatory action, not of the stroma as we just saw, but of the endothelium. Again, thought not to be an active infection. And when the endothelium is involved, it causes stromal edema as opposed to stromal infiltrate. KP are often present, but they may be hidden. If the stromal edema is severe enough, you may not see the KP. When you treat them, the edema gets better and then you can see the KP at a later date. And again, they may or may not have an obvious anterior chamber reaction. Sometimes you can't see it at the beginning because of the stroma is so swollen. And once that gets better, you can see the anterior chamber reaction. And these patients will often have an elevated intraocular pressure and not have elevated like 25, millimeters of mercury, but 40 or 45 or 50 millimeters of mercury. And that's thought to be due to a trabeculitis. And I'll tell my residents and fellows, if you see elevated intraocular pressure in the setting of iritis, think of herpes simplex or herpes zoster, we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but think of herpes when the pressure is up and you have an iritis, because typically iritis causes the pressure to go down. So here is an endothelia, so you can see significant KP there and some stromal edema. And you can see the stromal edema in the slit beam and the KP on the endothelial surface. And here's a more severe uh, kind of stromal or discoform keratitis, so significant edema. And then you can also see the KP there. And then iritis, we kind of talked a little bit about, but here you can have just an obvious AC reaction and KP, the KP may be so bad or the AC reaction may be so bad, you can get a hypopion, you also get a hyphema, and that occurs from kind of damage to the iris. Um, and you can get small blood vessels that break and cause a hyphema. Focal ischemia of the iris can cause iris atrophy and iris translumination defects. And they may also have, because of all the inflammation, a stromal keratitis or stromal, or, or stromal edema. And as I mentioned earlier, with an iritis, you can have a very, very elevated intraocular pressure. You need to think of herpes when this occurs. And here's a patient with you know, mutton fat KP in the setting of an eye with prior herpes simplex keratitis. Here too, 
stromal edema, but significant KP. And you can also see there's actually a small hypopia just because of the severe air chamber reaction. Again, here the cornea is pretty clear, but mutton fat KP in the setting of an eye with herpes simplex keratitis. And in retroillumination, you can see these iris translumination defects from you know, iris atrophy, probably iris ischemia in those areas. And this is fairly classic for herpes simplex, but also herpes zoster. So how do we treat kind of these inflammatory conditions of stromal keratitis, discoform endotheliitis, and iritis? Well, since they're inflammatory, we treat it with anti-inflammation medications, so topical steroids. And they range from four times a day, let's say to 12 to every hour, depending on the degree of inflammation. And the key when treating herpes simplex, and we'll talk later about herpes zoster, but the key is to slowly taper the medication over months. If I'm starting off at every hour and they're responding well, I may go to every two fairly quickly and four times a day fairly quickly, but when I taper from four, three, two, one, then it's a much slower taper over months. One of the main herpes conditions that get referred to me is the doctor will say, well, every time I taper the medications, they flare up because they're trying to taper the medications far too quickly. We also will typically use oral antivirals such as acyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day to prevent a viral kind of reinfection initially and whether to treat with five times a day, we'll often do that when they have iritis. And then how long to treat them with the oral antivirals is really unclear. Weeks, sometimes months um, is what we'll do that. But the stromal keratitis, disinform keratitis can take weeks. And depending on what you consider the final, can take months to go away. And the next form is necrotizing keratitis. This is thought to be a combination of active viral infection and also active inflammation that leads to corneal ulceration, melting, and it can be so bad that it can cause corneal perforation. When you see this, of course, you have to rule out a, a, a microbial keratitis or rule out infections, and these get treated with um, high-dose antiviral and then also some anti-inflammatory medications to try and get it to go away. And there's a patient with a necrotizing stromal keratitis in an eye with herpes simplex virus. And lastly, neurotrophic keratopathy. Um, this varies from persistent SPK to an epithelial defect all the way to um, stromal melting and perforation. And by definition is without an active viral infection. You see the classic rolled up smooth gray edges usually in the inferior half of the cornea and again, they may develop stromal ulceration. Here's a pretty classic photo of a neurotrophic keratitis, you know, central or lower part of the cornea with these thickened rolled up epithelial edges. Here's another one in a patient with herpes simplex. There's actually been some melting inferiorly and some thinning kind of infracentrally there. Why do people get neurotrophic keratopathy with herpes simplex keratitis? Well, sometimes it's the antiviral medication toxicity, there's low-grade inflammation, but it's really damage to the nerves from the active herpes virus. Um, when you get damage to the nerves, there are no growth factors, there's a poor blink, poor wetting of the surface, and then people will often rub their eyes, and since they can't feel their corneas, they don't realize that they're actually touching their own corneas. Now, the treatment for neurotrophic keratopathy Here's a long list of treatment for neurotrophic keratopathy. Whenever, uh, well, when I tell residents and fellows, when you see a list like this as a treatment, then you know there's no one good treatment, otherwise the list wouldn't be this long. But we think about decreasing toxic medications, lubrication, judicious use of steroids. If they're inflamed, I use steroids. If they're not inflamed, I don't use steroids. Autologous serum, bandage lens, amniotic membrane, um, either self-retained, uh, like on a ring, like a Procare or under a bandage lens, do a tarsorophy, you can do a sutured or glued amniotic membrane. And then one of the uh, kind of end stage is, is a conjunctival flap surgery, which can be very successful, but um, doesn't help the vision very much. The newest treatment for neurotrophic keratopathy is Synedrimin, Octavate, made by Dompe. This is recombinant human nerve growth factor. It was approved for neurotrophic keratopathy by the FDA in the US in, uh, in 2018. So we've had experience for over about four years of this. It's a drop six times a day for eight weeks and it's obtained through specialty pharmacies. It's rather difficult to get. You have to 
kind of fill out a form and it goes through this big approval process. Um, and it often will take weeks to get this medication um, into the hands of a patient. The big kind of trial that was done, this is called the Reparo study uh, done in Europe, about 150 patients randomized to two different strengths of synedrimin against placebo. And they looked at epithelial healing at four weeks and eight weeks and 50 to 60 and up to 70% of patients were healed in the treatment group with a placebo group only 15 to 30% depending on the strength that was used, which is significantly better for the uh, synedrimin group. But what impressed me the most about this study was if the epithelial defect was healed at eight weeks in the synedrimin group, 80% of those eyes were still healed at 48 weeks. Because a lot of times we know we can get a neurotrophic epithelial defect to heal with a bandage lens or with amniotic membrane, but as soon as you get rid of the bandage lens, amniotic membrane, or open up their tarsorophy, the defect comes back. Where with synedrimin, 80% were still healed at a year. One of the downsides of this medication is it's very expensive. It's about $95,000 in the US and a little bit less, $24,000 in Europe for an eight week course. I'm not sure if it's available um, in India or what the expense is, but it's certainly a very good medication, but rather expensive. This is what you're trying to avoid in neurotrophic keratopathy in herpes simplex and also herpes zoster. As I mentioned, amniotic membrane, here's a prokara in an eye, that can be very effective in some patients. And there's a patient of mine who had an, uh, a conjunctival flap for a chronic neurotrophic keratopathy in an eye with herpes simplex. Now, how do we prevent herpes simplex? Well, we, I, and, and Will's eye was involved in the head studies, herpes eye disease studies, um, about two, must be 30 years ago now. Um, and there were numerous arms of the, of the head study, but probably the most important arm that really changed the practice of medicine demonstrated that long-term acyclovir, 400 milligrams twice a day, the FDA study, uh, I'm sorry, the head study was for one year, um, but this showed that it decreased recurrences of herpes by 50%. And it was especially effective in patients with multiple episodes of stromal keratitis. So this really changed how we treat herpes. We used to just use this medication short term and then get them off the medications. But now patients who have had, you know, especially a couple episodes of herpes keratitis, we'll put them on long-term oral acyclovir. We can also use val acyclovir or famcyclovir. Now, after herpes inflammatory keratitis, as I mentioned, some people will need to be on low-dose topical steroids for months, if not years. Some of these patients just need to be on a low dose once a day, every other day of a low dose steroid, um, and they won't recur. Whereas if you take them off, they will recur. If they get scarring, sometimes you can use eczema laser PTK, but unfortunately the scarring after herpes simplex tends to be on the deeper side. So it tends not to respond very well to PTK. If there's not that much scarring, but there's significant irregularity, a rigid gas peripheral contact lens can be very, very helpful for a lot of these patients. There's still too much scarring for that. A cornea transplant may be required for better vision. And there's a patient with some mild haze uh, and some probably some irregularity, not too bad. There's a patient with you know, moderate scarring, probably significant irregularity. A hard lens would probably work very well here. There's been significant scarring and lipid deposition. Uh, a contact lens is obviously not gonna work here. This patient would need a cornea transplant. Now, when we're talking about transplants for um, patients with herpes, the eye should be quiet for at least six months prior to a transplant. If you transplant these patients, um, when they have active inflammation, the results are rather poor. What type of transplant? Well, you can try a half thickness lamellar graft if it's really in the anterior half of the cornea, HELK, a hemi-automated lamellar keratoplasty popularized by Donald Tan um, out of Singapore, or FALC, femtosecond laser-assisted lamellar keratoplasty, or a DALK or a PK. And when I do a transplant for patients who have a history of herpes, I will put them on prophylactic oral antivirals, something like acyclovir twice a day, 400 milligrams twice a day. Question is, how long did they get on this? Three months, six months, 12 months? Tell you, if I have a patient who had a graft for herpes, I put them on this dose forever. I think that they now deserve this dose forever. And I will also do a temporary tarsorophy at the time of any transplant I do for herpes. I keep this in for two, four, six weeks 
just to give their epithelium a good chance to heal because of the neurotrophic aspect of these eyes. Here's a patient of mine, I'm um, a significant, you know, half thickness scarring. I did a half thickness cornea transplant um, with good results. Now, what about herpes simplex and cataract surgery? Um, well, the concerns are, are multiple. Well, one is corneal scarring. And sometimes this opacity may not look terrible in the office, but when you lay these patients down under an operating microscope, the view to the cataract is much, much worse than the view at the slit lamp. So I've had patients where you try, you say, oh, we do cataract surgery, you bring them to the OR and just, you can't complete the surgery. You can't, you can't even start the surgery because the view is so poor. Of course, a lot of these eyes have a regular astigmatism. So you have to think about not using a toric IOL, especially if you think that they will need or do need a rigid gas perm lens, or if they'll need a, a, an anterior graft, at some point a toric IOL may not be a great option. These eyes often have neurotrophic keratopathy. You have to keep that in mind. Um, and they have to think that they can get an inflammatory keratitis or iritis after their cataract surgery. And of course, you've got to keep in mind that they can get a recurrent herpes simplex keratitis. For these, I really want no active keratitis for minimum of three months, but ideally six months before the cataract surgery. I will use prophylactic oral antivirals. Um, they get more steroids than usual and they're tapered more slowly than usual. And the cataract surgeon needs to remember to stop the tapering at their pre-cataract level. So if a patient was on, let's just say lodopredinol once a day for a while that kept the eye quiet, they have to remember that when they taper their steroids after the cataract surgery, it isn't a standard cataract taper where they stop their steroids at four weeks or six weeks or whatever it is, they only go down to their pre-cataract level. And we see many patients where the doctor forgets that the patient had herpes and then they stop the steroids and then the patients will flare up. Now, of course, you want to minimize their toxic medications like the top, topical NSAIDs. And just a quick um, note on resistance to HSV, to, to, uh, to um, HSV treatment. Resistance to acyclovir is reported to be less than 1% in, in immunocompetent patients. Immunosuppressed patients, maybe up to 3 to 6%. Uses a mutation of the thymidine kinase gene that's needed to convert these medications to inhibit viral replication. Um, and if you really suspect it, you can use IV foscarnet or IV sidofovir, or even high dose IV acyclovir may be enough to overcome some of these resistances, but fortunately, they're not very common. So in summary, HSV dendrites, they're treated with topical antivirals or a full dose oral antivirals for seven to 14 days, and then at least the topicals are stopped, otherwise you risk toxicity. Immune stromal keratitis, discoform keratitis, endotheliitis, these inflammatory reactions, we treat with aggressive steroid drops and often will cover with oral antivirals. For iritis, they get aggressive steroid drops and the full dose oral antivirals until they're improving and then the antiviral dose can be decreased. If patients have a history of multiple herpes simplex episodes, especially if they're stromal keratitis episodes or if they've had a history of herpes, um, a, a, a transplant for herpes, they get on prophylactic oral antivirals for months, if not years, if not forever. And in general, when tapering steroids in eyes with herpes simplex, and we'll talk about herpes zoster a little bit, they're very, very slowly tapered, especially as it gets down to the low dose. The every hour, to every two hours, to every four hours, that can go fairly quickly if they're responding well, but once they're down to BID or once a day or every other day, it's a very slow taper. Okay, I know I'd say I would take questions at the end. So now I'm gonna go on to um, varicella zoster virus or herpes zoster ophthalmicus. This is a virus that causes chicken pox after primary infection um, and chicken pox is a self-limited rash. But here too, just like in herpes simplex, the virus migrates to the sensory ganglia and can reactivate years later. Initial chicken pox rarely involves the eye. It often involves the skin of the whole body. They get a reticular vas. You can have it on the eyelids and it can scar. They can involve the conjunctiva or limbus, but that's pretty uncommon. Um, and you can have it in the cornea with punctate staining or dendrite or discoform keratitis, but again, very, very uncommon. In fact, the only person that I've ever seen with a chicken pox related eye problem, you know, not shingles, which we'll talk about, but chicken pox, this is a patient I saw, it was a two-year-old patient, 
had active chicken pox on their skin. And here is what I think was a pock on their limbus. As I said, the zoster virus can reactivate years later. Typically, it's a vesicular dermatomal rash that we call shingles, most commonly on the thrunk from the thoracic nerve, thoracic nerve over half the time. But 50 to 20% of the time, it can involve the trigeminal ganglia, leading to herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And some very unfortunate uh, people, 1% of the time, can get bilateral herpes zoster. And about half to two thirds of the ones that involve the trigeminal ganglia will actually involve the eyeball as opposed to just a skin around the eye. In the US, there's said to be about a million cases a year. There's about a 30% lifetime incidence of getting shingles, and that is increasing over the past several decades. And interestingly, there's about a 5% recurrent zoster rate. One of the risks for zoster, well, the number one risk by far is age. The older you get, the more likely you are to get this. Also in HIV positive and other immunocompromised patients, and with COVID-19, there seems to be an increased risk of zoster in patients after a COVID-19 infection. Now, the incidence of this zoster, as I mentioned, has been going up for decades, um, since 1993. Now, people were blaming it on the varicella zoster vaccination, so the chickenpox vaccination in kids, so kids no longer get chickenpox because they were vaccinated. But that vaccine started in 1995, and it didn't start all around the world, so it's unclear whether it's directly related or possibly just a confounding a variable that may be partly related. As you all know, there are three divisions of the trigeminal nerve. The ophthalmic division is the most commonly affected with zoster and the frontal nerve more typically. If it hits the nasociliary nerve, which kind of innervates the tip of the nose, that's Hutchinson's sign, and it's said to double the risk of eye disease if, uh, if you have Hutchinson's sign. And you get this dermatomal rash and it can lead to scarring. The rash doesn't cross the midline, but you can get swelling that crosses the midline. So sometimes, you know, doctors are fooled because the swelling kind of involves the other side. They say, oh, it's bilateral, therefore it's not zoster. The rash tends to be not by the, 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 um, vesic the vesicular rash doesn't cross the midline much, but the swelling can certainly cross the midline. It's often preceded by this tingling or burning or warm sensation in the forehead um, area, scalp area. And actually oftentimes people will go to the emergency room with this tingling, burning, warm sensation. They're checked, there's no rash. They say, oh, go home, it's nothing. And a day or two later, they'll come in with a classic shingles rash. And we also have this prodrome of fever, chills, malaise, headache, but that's, that's many fewer people. The vesicles will last two to three weeks. They can cause scarring. And if they involve the severely involve the eyelids, they can cause real eyelid problems like necrosis, trachiasis, lash loss, entropion, et cetera. But one of the big problems with the rash is the post neuralgia we'll talk about in a little bit. Here's a very mild um, uh, zoster um, uh, infection that was treated very early with oral antivirals and did not get worse. It's a little bit more severe uh, uh, shingles rash. Much more severe shingles rash involves the tip of the nose there, so that would be positive Hutchinson sign. Again, another rather severe rash involving the tip of the nose. You can see it really does not cross the midline, but sometimes the swelling can go across. Here's a mild um, shingles rash in a child, and here's a much more severe shingles rash in a child. It can affect the conjunctiva, get hyperemia, get a follicular conjunctivitis, you get episcleritis, scleritis, you can get iritis and trabeculitis, as we mentioned earlier for herpes simplex. When it affects the cornea, again, it can have a very similar um, pattern to herpes simplex. You can get SPK, but you can get a dendritic, this microdendritic epithelial keratitis, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. And one thing you get in shingles and zoster that you do not get with herpes simplex are these delayed onset mucus plaque pseudodendrites, which again, we'll talk about in a minute. And again, stromal infiltrates, discoform, endotheliitis, necrotizing keratitis, and neurotrophic keratopathy are all very similar to what you see in herpes simplex. And in fact, sometimes if you showed a picture of all these with simplex or zoster, you would not be able to tell them apart. In the cornea, as I said, SPK, but the microdendroids that they can get, these look like classic simplex dendrites. 
that they tend to be kind of more peripheral and numerous and smaller, and they clear very quickly within a few days without treatment. They may leave a little mild haze, but you can culture varicella zoster virus from these if you get them. And sometimes it can actually occur before the, 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 rat, the skin rash occurs. This is a very early finding that goes away very quickly. And here's a patient of mine who actually had these micro dendrites on the cornea with no skin rash. And we actually thought it was herpes simplex. And then a day or two later came in with a severe shingles rash. And these were actually gone at that point. Now the delayed onset mucus plaque dendrites or pseudodendrites are pretty classic for, for shingles, for, for herpes zoster ophthalmicus. These can occur occasionally days, but usually weeks to months after the rash. They're elevated coarse. They have this kind of staining on top of them. The dendritiform, meaning they have these branching lines, but they don't have terminal end bulbs that are classic of herpes simplex dendrites. And they, they appear elevated and almost stuck onto the cornea. They're self-limited, um, but they can last months and they can be painful and they can affect the vision if they're in the visual axis. And here's what they look like. So it's, here's what they look like. The, you can see that they're, they're dendritiform, but they don't have the classic terminal end bulbs. They're slightly elevated. Here's how there's, there's a staining pattern. Um, they kind of have this semi-staining on them, but they're not frank epithelial defects. Here too, this looks a little bit more kind of mucoid stuck on. And here it's actually rather elevated and, and, and kind of you know, mucousy there. Now, how, did, how are these treated? Well, lubrication can be used, topical steroids can be used. Some people will debride them. Um, I will typically use a topical antiviral. Um, Viderabine ointment, Vira A, was available to us many years ago, but no longer. That worked quite well, in my experience, for these pseudodendrites. Nowadays, gancyclovir gel, I find rather helpful. Not quite as helpful as the Vira A ointment, but it can work pretty well, um, especially the immunocompromised patients. Um, I've talked to many people and some will say, oh, the oral antivirals work well for these. I have tried it and I don't find it very helpful for these. I have nothing against using it, um, but I think the topical antivirals tend to work better. I, I've not found that um, trifluridine drops work well for this, plus they're much more toxic, so I, I tend not to use that for these. But the gancyclovir gel I find helpful. And the immune stromal keratitis, the inflammatory reactions in the cornea from herpes zoster, as I mentioned earlier, are similar to herpes simplex. Um, and basically they're treated very similarly to herpes simplex um, with topical steroids. Um, and whether antivirals are used or not, we'll talk about in a minute, um, but there's topical steroids with a very slow taper. The one difference is that the taper in herpes zoster often needs to be slower than the taper in herpes simplex. Here's a patient of mine um, who uh, has significant inflammatory keratitis with KP in, after a, um, a shingles episode. Here's another patient after shingles episode who has, has a stromal keratitis, perhaps an early necrotizing keratitis. And here are two patients after herpes uh, zoster keratitis who now have scarring and neovascularization and lipid deposition related to the zoster. You can also get iritis, as you can get in, uh, in herpes simplex um, with elevated intraocular pressure um, in a similar manner. Here too, you, know, you can see the KP in an eye after shingles. If you just saw this picture, you wouldn't be able to tell whether this is herpes simplex or herpes zoster. This patient happened to have had shingles not long before. The neurotrophic keratopathy, also similar to herpes simplex, although it tends to be worse, a deeper neurotrophic keratopathy. About a quarter of patients will have a significant neurotrophic keratopathy, and it's kind of treated, and again, in a similar way to the way we treated it um, in, in herpes simplex. Here, a very localized area of epithelial defect, and you can see significant thinning in that area in an eye after shingles. Again, lubrication, patching, tarsorophy, AMT, conj flap, um, and again, you could try synedrimin. Here's a patient who had a central perforation and is now status postcorneal glue and with a deepening anterior chamber. 
So how do we treat herpes zoster? Well, there's a very, very good evidence that if you catch the uh, shingles within 72 hours of the rash, it responds well to treat with oral antivirals. And in the US, it's FDA approved for acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times a day for seven to 10 days. And that's double the herpes simplex dose, the full herpes simplex dose. And then valley cyclovir, one gram, three times a day, and fam cyclovir, 500 milligrams, three times a day. And if they're severely immunocompromised or can't take oral medications, they can use um, IV antivirals or IV acyclovir. Why do we do this treatment? Well, it's been shown to decrease acute pain, shorten the duration of the skin lesions and viral shedding, decrease new lesion formation, decrease pseudodendrites, decrease stomal keratitis and uveitis. And at least for two of the medications, Famvir and Valtrex, it decreases the incidence of postherpetic neuralgia. The beginning of my career 30 years ago, we used systemic steroids to prevent postherpetic neuralgia. And for a variety of reasons, those actually occasionally made people worse. Um, they got the viremias from, from the zoster, and it didn't seem to help. So it's somewhat controversial these days, but I typically do not use systemic steroids to, to, uh, at the time of, of shingles. And they get the inflammatory complications just like they get in herpes simplex. And it's a slow taper of steroids. And as I mentioned, it's a slower taper than in herpes simplex. And then whether antiviral coverage is helpful or not, we really don't know. We do know that there's very good evidence of antivirals for the treatment of acute zoster. As I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the, the oral antivirals in the first 72 hours, and I'll extend that to the first five days. If someone comes in five days after the rash started, I will still give them oral antivirals. But there isn't good evidence for the treatment of recurrent zoster in the eye. So whether it's pseudodendrites or whether it's um, iritis or whether it's a stromal keratitis, there's no good evidence of oral antivirals after the first you know, few, three to five days. However, there's a study going on called the Z study, the zoster eye disease study spearheaded by Elizabeth Cohen, who was my senior partner at Wills for many, many years. She's now um, at NYU, uh, New York University, working with a uh, National Eye Institute and National Institute of Health sponsored study looking at Val Valley Cyclovir, one gram a day versus placebo for a year to see whether that decreases the um, zoster related eye disease during that year. And then they go off the medication and they're followed up for another six months. Um, this is a model very similar to the original herpes simplex head study that I mentioned earlier that showed that there was a 50% decrease in herpes simplex related eye disease while they were on the acyclovir. Here the idea is, does Valtrex work for herpes zoster? And that study is ongoing. Actually recruitment will end at the end of December and they'll follow patients um, for another year and a half. I mentioned posterbank neuralgia earlier. Um, that's persistent pain one month or three months after onset, depending on the definition. And it's a good number of people, 60% of, uh, of patients have post pain at a month, but fortunately goes down to about 15% at six months. However, it's much more of a risk in older patients than in younger patients. Only 2% if you're under 50, but maybe a third of patients over age 80. And this isn't just a little irritating pain that people notice or a little skin sensitivity. This pain can be absolutely devastating pain. And in fact, it's a leading cause of suicide in older patients in the US. What about the treatments for post neuralgia? Well, again, if you see a list this long for treatments of a condition, it means there's no one good treatment or the list wouldn't be this long. So you can use a capsaicin, um, which is a, a hot pepper extract cream or lidocaine cream or patch on the skin. If you have a, a localized area, uh, you can use doxepin cream or gabapentin, which is Neurontin pills or pregabalin Lyrica pills. The tricyclic antidepressants can be used, um, cimetidine, nerve block, uh, electrostimulation, acupuncture. Many of these things can be tried. Um, some are helpful for some people, but nothing works for everybody. And some patients aren't helped by any of these, unfortunately. Now there's some relatively new data coming out that you know, zoster really is a bad condition. You do not want to have it. And one of the bad things is the risk for stroke, for CVA after shingles. It's a meta-analysis of nine studies 
that showed an, a twofold increase of stroke in the first month after zoster ophthalmicus, and 1.78 um, of zoster anywhere in the body. After three months and 12 months, the risk decreases, but it's still after a year, 20% increase in stroke after having shingles. Not something you want. And here is increased risk of dementia. These are two studies out of Taiwan looking at um, patients with shingles and the risk of dementia, depending on how you measure it and how you look at it, 11% um, percent increase or up to kind of three times greater developing dementia with herpes zoster. Not as bad with herpes or elsewhere in the body. So here's just a personal uh, experience of mine. This is a patient that I followed. He was a dentist early in my career, 1992, um, had shingles, had stoma keratitis. We were treating him. He wasn't a very compliant patient, was lost to follow up. And in 1999, seven years later, came back with an eye looking like this. He actually had to quit being a dentist um, and had to find other work because of this. So this is a bad disease. How do we prevent it? Well, there was a, the first um, shingles vaccine, the first um, zoster vaccine was a Zostavax. It was a live viral vaccine, a live virus. It was FDA approved almost 20 years ago now in 2006. And it reduced zoster by about 50% and a post neurology by about two thirds, um, and which is great. That's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful medication. It tend to be more effective in younger patients in their 50s, less effective in older patients in their 70s and 80s. You have to stop any antivirals for a day before, for two weeks after, since it was a live virus. Um, it was not for immunocompromised patients. And it was um, not, uh, there wasn't a lot, not a lot of uptake with this um, uh, zoster vaccine in, in the US. Probably because it wasn't easy to use and a bunch of complications. Uh, contraindications, um, and the success was good, but not great. But what do we have now? Well, we have the Shingrix vaccine. Um, this is a recombinant subunit, so it's not a live virus. It is two shots that are two to six months apart. And this study came out in 2015, large study, over 15,000 patients with three years of follow-up, 50 years and older, with a 97% effectiveness rate. And it wasn't contraindicated in immunocompromised patients because it wasn't a live virus. Here was a, uh, another trial of about 14,000 patients with almost four-year mean follow-up in age over 70. Remember, these are the patients that did not do as well with the first Zostavax. And here, you'll get 90% effective. Um, and this was FDA approved in the US back in 2017 for patients over the age of 50. So in summary, Herpes zoster is common and increasing. It should be treated, herpes zoster ophthalmic, well, any herpes zoster actually, any shingle should be treated emergently with oral antivirals. Pseudodendrites may resolve on their own, but I find that topical gancyclovir can be very helpful. Inflammatory keratitis or iritis requires steroids with a very slow taper with or without antiviral coverage. We don't have the answer for that yet, but hopefully we will in the next couple of years. Post hepatic neuralgia can be severe and should not be ignored. If patients have it, they should, and, and you can't manage it or it's not being managed properly, you can send them to a pain specialist for that. And the new uh, zoster vaccine can be very effective and should be encouraged by all of us. I tell all my patients who are 50 and older, you know, I ask them, have you had your shingles vaccine? And uh, many of them have not. It is not being promoted, at least not by US uh, general practitioners. You know, they're internists and, and family doctors for some reason. The uptake here is rather low. But I can tell you that people who are the evangelists who promote this the most are those who get shingles in their eye and they will then tell all their friends and all their family, you have to get it, you have to get it, you have to get it. So thank you very much. It was an honor to be invited to speak today and I'm happy to take any questions. Really, it's a wonderful talk. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah, can you? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was a great talk. And uh, uh, I, I, I always knew about you, and that is why my only 
suggestion for Dr. Ramakrishnan when he asked for me for a, for a good cornea specialist was you and you have done great justice to your uh, talk. What is also interesting is there is a lineup of questions, which also is pretty unusual in uh, these kind of meetings today, but I'm very, very surprised by the uh, quality of questions. And I think we should just uh, go to the questions. But sure. Just, before that, I think if there are two points, which are take home points from this lecture, two very, very important points. The first is how do you treat an active dendritic keratitis? Uh, Chris made a mention that after 15 days, if you still see staining, it is probably due to drug toxicity and not due to the remnants of infection. People who have practiced long enough have seen such kinds of patients being referred to you as non-healing viral keratitis uh, after three or four weeks of intense uh, topical antiviral therapy. I think that is the first take home point. The second take home point was the word slowly, the way the word slowly was spelled. Uh, S-L-O-O-O-O-O-O-O-W-L-Y. Uh, I also like uh, to use it. Sometimes I give it to my patients, use it on Monday and Thursday. You know, something like a religious practice, uh, break a coconut on Monday and Thursday in a temple, just like that. You just apply it on a Monday and Thursday. It doesn't mean uh, that it has to be used on Monday and Thursday, but just to give uh, an importance of the uh, longevity of the use of uh, steroids. When we used to read a book, uh, The Small In and Toft, they used to have a sentence called the homeopathic dosing of steroids. Uh, you know, just to maintain it, uh, over a period of time. And I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of these two things. And I'm very, very happy that you, you emphasize these two points, which, which I think are very, very, very crucial points. So let's go, uh, go to the first question. The first question is, is there a role for topical antibiotic or antiviral in immune stromal keratitis? Um, I, I do not think there's a role for topical antibiotic unless there's an epithelial defect. And I don't, I don't think there's a role for topical antiviral um, because I think that we're probably not getting much effect from that and it's probably somewhat toxic. Whether there's an effect of oral antiviral or not is somewhat questionable, but in general, I will use an oral antiviral in those patients. Um, especially if they've had more than one episode of stromal keratitis or inflammatory keratitis. Uh, Chris, uh, it, do you think, is there a role for topical acyclovir for necrotizing stromal keratitis very specifically or for all stromal keratitis, I, you still don't use it? I, I think, yeah, for, if it's a necrotizing stromal keratitis, I think there's a role for oral antiviral, acyclovir, faltric, you know, topical, um, I have nothing against topical, but I really, and acyclovir is not very toxic to the surface, certainly the ointment, um, but I don't want any real topical toxicity if I can get the same effect with the oral medication. So I will use oral antiviral and I will use you know, a pretty hefty dose of oral antiviral in those patients with necrotizing um, keratitis. Yeah. Uh, you as a country, you know, you, you were not, uh using acyclovir. We, we used acyclovir much before you, and you've been used, uh, you, you used- The to, ointment, uh, ointment or pills? The, the acyclovir ointment. Yeah, we, it only became available recently and it's hardly available in the US, correct. Yeah, so, so you have used a trifluorothymidin before, and now you're using acyclovir and gancyclovir gel, and we're just talking only about topical. What is your experience of uh, comparing gancyclovir with uh, the TFT, given a choice, which one would you use? Oh, gancyclovir is better medication, less toxic medication, fewer times a day. The problem in the US is it's often much more expensive than the trifluridine drops. Um, but I will tell my patients, you know, for some medications, I'll say, well, you can get the cheaper one. It's not that big a deal. Here, if they can afford the gancyclovir gel, I think it's much, much, much better than the trifluridine drops. 
Okay. So that that's you prefer definitely gancyclovir over trifluorothymidine. So we are not losing out much because we don't have uh, trifluorothymidine uh, here. We use more of acyclovir and gancyclovir. Yeah. Yeah, acyclovir I think works well too. We mm -hmm. just don't have access to it very much. What is the differential diagnosis of herpes simplex virus geographic ulcer, especially fungal corneal ulcer? Uh, have, yeah. yeah the, the, the herpes simplex, the geographic ulcers, sometimes they're so big um, that they often lose their kind of classic dendrites at the edges. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell that it's actually a herpes simplex infection. I mean, if they have a history of herpes, herpes that will give you uh, an idea, but if it's a first time, then you may not know. Um, the, stroma, the stroma in the middle of a geographic ulcer tends to be a little bit hazy, but tends not to be an infiltrate. It's not white and it's not an infiltrate, it ten, and it tends not to be ulcerated unless it's also become neurotrophic with a, with a melt. Um, so it's, it, it, usually it's not, um, it's not confused with a fungal keratitis. Uh, it might be a, an early bacterial keratitis, but usually not. Usually it's not really an infiltrate, it's more haze. And you have to think about um, uh, simplex zoster and then toxicity is the other thing that can cause that. Um, medication toxicity, but also topical anesthetic um, can look like that. So if somebody, had a uh, scratched cornea, they went to the ER, they could steal the preparacaine from the ER, from the doctor's office, that happens here sometimes at least, you can get um, something that can look like a big geographic ulcer. Uh, one of our uh, uh, audience today has uh, put up a, a, a scenario. Uh, she says she has a 12 year old patient with herpes simplex virus keratitis uh, for which uh, she had done a graft one year back, now failed for the past six months, has an episode of recurrence in the graft 15 days prior. How long do you wait for the next graft? And should the, should the patient be on uh, oral acyclovir uh, after the graft? Uh, so I would wait you know, six months at least uh, for any active infection or stromal keratitis for doing a new graft. And I put all my graft patients on oral acyclovir or valacyclovir or famcyclovir, so I'm oral medication for at least a year. And usually I'll keep them on low dose, like acyclovir 400 twice a day forever after a graft, especially in a case like this where they've already failed one graft. I, I, I presume that uh, the surgeon went ahead uh, and did the graft of failing for amblyopia. What do you, what do you really think, uh, especially for children, uh, when, when you are really worried about recurrence in a graft? Do you see a role for optical iridectomy at all before you, you proceed for a, for a graft in such kind of patients? You know, we, we do not, I mean, in the U.S. in general, we are not big proponents of optical iridectomies. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I've read some evidence that is, is not in favor of optical iridectomies. So we're just not, I think it's more popular around the world than it is in the U.S. So we do not do that very much. Okay. Uh, so you, 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 you agree uh, to go ahead because I think at least 10 years before when I uh, read an editorial in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, I remember reading that editorial, which I don't uh, remember the name of the author though. He said, if since it affects only one eye and since there's a chance of recurrence of, infect, of uh, the viral infection in the graft, if there is some residual vision in that I do not operate, do not go for a corneal transplantation. And then we have your paper, which says that with effective uh, and good antiviral control mechanism, it is possible for patients uh, with simplex keratitis to have a graft and have a better vision after the graft. So is the thing yeah. changed now, or was it always an issue of uh, usage of the uh, oral acyclovir medication? I, my guess is it's oral acyclovir has really helped a lot. 
Um, the, the oral antivirals in general have really helped a lot. I mean, when I started my practice again in 1991, I'm not sure we had many, if any of these oral antivirals available. And we did a lot of transplants for herpes simplex. And nowadays it's, it's pretty uncommon, not, not rare, but it's much, much less common nowadays to do it. So I think that oral acyclovir, oral antivirals in general have really helped decrease the amount of scarring that we're seeing in a whole population of patients. And I think it has helped the success rate after transplants. And uh, what is your uh, systemic investigation profile when you, when you do it and uh, the duration when you really put the patient on oral acyclovir for life? I, I left there, I mean, in general, I'm asking about kidney disease. If they have kidney, any kidney problems, I will write their medical doctor and just let their medical doctor know that they're on this medication. The acyclovir 400 twice a day is a pretty low dose and it's rare wow. that it causes a problem unless they already have kidney disease. But if you use a a acyclovir uh, 400 five times a day, or if you're using um, 800 five times a day, as in the zoster dose, then we will often get kidney function tests and let their medical doctor know that they're on this. They're usually not on the high dose for that long, but I still let their medical doctor know. And uh, one of the audience has asked a question, when, when can we safely go for a refractive surgery? And if we do a refractive surgery, do you need to put them on systemic uh, acyclovir cover? So if in general, herpes simplex and herpes zoster, to me, conservative me are contraindications to refractive surgery. Now, if someone had a classic HSV dendrite 10 years ago, They've had zero complications. They have zero scarring. They're not neurotrophic. There's no SBK. Could they have refractive surgery? Probably, but still I'd be a little bit hesitant. Um, in any case, to answer the second question, absolutely they get on oral antivirals for a period of time, whether it's a month or three months, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but they go on that after any kind of any ocular surgery. Then the question is, is PRK better, surface ablation better, or LASIK better for these patients. And I'm more of a proponent in general of PRK uh, for, for people who've had cornea issues. Um, and I've certainly seen patients who have had herpes simplex melt their LASIK flaps. So I would say probably PRK is probably a safer procedure in someone who's had uh, herpes in the eye at all, um, but I'm not saying it's a. I'm not saying any refractive surgery is great in patients who have had herpes. Uh, I, I'm just warning the president. I, I'm really surprised by the by the questions which are coming out. out. Uh, do you do you, can we afford the Zoom to go on for some? Yeah, more? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. okay. So thank you. I'm really happy with so much of uh, the audience yeah. putting so many questions. Yeah. What is your choice in stromal keratitis in neonates, infants, and older children? Is there a choice, especially acyclovir and valacevir in children? And the second question is, is there any interaction with oral steroids? Uh, in children, typically they're getting acyclovir because either it's intravenous um, or it's also liquid. And I'm pretty sure Valley Cycle, at least in the US, Valley Cycle and Fans IV do not come in liquid and they don't come in IV. So they can't, the, the, the kids can't take pills. So they're almost always on acyclovir. Um, I do not know of any interac adverse interaction between any of these antivirals and steroids. And we often use them together with systemic steroids or topical steroids. What is the time of cataract surgery post herpes zoster ophthalmicus? Is it any different than herpes simplex keratitis? I, I think they're still similar. You know, I would wait till they're quiet for three months or ideally six months after. Mm -hmm. And then whether they should go on, whether the shingles patient <laughs> should go on oral antivirals is an unknown. You know, hopefully we'll find that out from the Z study. Um, you know, in the US, some doctors would put them on oral antivirals, some doctors wouldn't. I personally have not been putting my shingles patients on long-term oral antivirals. I just, I didn't think the evidence showed that it helped. 
We'll see whether that's true when the Z study comes out. And you made a mention that uh, over the age of 50, you would uh, strongly advise people to get a vaccine. Uh, even for the new vaccine, uh, is, there, is the same age group uh, is what you would advise or would, would, you, would you advocate this for uh, early on in their lives? The new oh, well, in the, in, it's interesting. The original vaccine, the Zostavax, the Merck live virus vaccine approved in whatever, 2007, that was approved at age 60 and above initially. And of course, we know that you know, a lot of patients get shingles at, at 50 and above. So um, studies were done and later it, that was later changed to 50. So when the new vaccine, the Shingrix vaccine was studied, it was studied at 50 and above and it was approved at 50 and above. So I recommend it to everybody at 50 and above because insurance will pay for it. It's FDA approved, it's on label. If a 45 year old came to me and said, oh, I can get this vaccine, should I get it for free and I'm not gonna sue you, blah, blah, blah. I would say, yes, get it. You know, even younger patients probably you know, should get it. And actually the, shingle, the, sh the new shingles vaccine is FDA approved, I think at 18 years old, if you're immunocompromised. So there is, there is a, a lower age if you're immunocompromised in the US, but for non-immunocompromised patients, it's 50 and above. And still 50 and above catches most people with shingles. Although we know that young people who are healthy can get it too. Chris, uh, during the uh, height of the, uh, the HIV epidemic, we did see a lot of uh, herpes or uh, in young adults. Do we, do we have any study which says uh, that the incidence is still continuing in the same manner or uh, the, the, the virus has attenuated and uh, so we don't see that much of a hitchhiko recurrence associated with HIV? Do we have an answer to that question? Well, I, uh, there may be an answer. I don't know if there's a study that looks at that, but I think that HIV, at least in the US, is so well controlled on the heart medications that the, these patients, for the most part, are minimally immunocompromised. Um, so I, I think that that's not a, a, as big a deal now as it was in the past. Um, I certainly think if you have a a patient who is, has uncontrolled HIV, they're gonna be at higher risk for shingles. You know, 30 years ago, if a young patient, someone under 50 got shingles, then they underwent an entire, you know, infectious disease workup, immunocompromised workup. There was a whole million dollar workup that was done on these patients because if you got shingles, it meant you were immunocompromised. Well, nowadays we know that's not true. We know that you know, many, many, many people who get shingles, even at age five or 10 or 15 or 20 years old, it's just, it's just bad luck for them. There's no, no known findable immunocompromised status. So they're not even work up. Pediatricians will not work up patients who are otherwise healthy who get shingles. In herpes zoster ophthalmicus, is the oral acyclovir stopped completely after seven to 14 days of treatment? Or tapered and stopped. I'm just reading out the questions. These are not my. Yeah, so you see, it stopped. It just stopped completely. It's you know whether the studies were at seven to ten days in, in the U.S. So they were just it's done for that period and then it stopped. Now, if someone has, you know that that's for shingles anywhere in the body, including the eye. Um, if somebody has you know significant eye issues at ten days and they're still on the oral acyclovir, then we could consider, oh, you still have to see eye issues. Let's continue it at some dose, high dose, low dose, nobody knows, but some doctors will do that. I don't think that's wrong, but there's little evidence that that helps currently. And, and, and to all the attendees today, once again, I would like to reiterate that statement. We, we, we tend to believe that uh, a topical medication uh, is more safer than a systemic medication. But with regard to viral keratitis, we are more concerned about using topical acyclovir for more than 15 days. But for uh, indicated patients, uh, we can use systemic acyclovir as long as the systemic parameters are, are pretty okay. Uh, Project Press, can I tell one quick story? Yes. 
please. Well, just to just to um, reiterate the comment you made earlier about slow taper of medications. Um, when I joined the practice at Will's Eye, I took over a, 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 the practice of a doctor who, who left and, and went back to Chile, Juan Aronson. And Juan Aronson had many of his herpes, especially herpes zoster patients, but sometimes herpes simplex patients, especially herpes zoster, who were on, let's say, one drop of FML, fluoromethylone, once a week. And I come into this practice, I'm the young, you know, hot shot coming into Wills, and I'm selling it, Mrs. Jones, one drop of FML once a week is not helping you at all. This is homeopathic, it's silly, I forget how I said it, but you do not need to be on this medication. Well, over the next year after doing that in a bunch of patients and a bunch of them recurred, they came back to me and said, Dr. Rapuano, Dr. Aronson had me on this one drop a week for 10 years, they didn't have a recurrence. You come in, you stop the drop, and now I've recurred. Why has this happened? And I basically said, it happened because I'm an idiot. I was wrong and I should have done what Dr. Aronson did and I will not make that mistake again. But that was a real life lesson to me that one drop once a week, which you would think should do nothing, right? It's a drop in the bucket can be effective for many of these patients. The lesson I will never forget. Yes, I, I, I think uh, that's been, we, we are restating these two, two things which everybody from here are going to carry uh, with them uh, of not using topical acyclovir for more than 15 days at a stretch. And also when you taper, taper very, very, very slowly. Uh, that is one thing. And uh, people were very interested when you showed the picture of bilateral herpes uh, keratitis. Do you, one, do you see it uh, more than that case? Have you seen uh, one other case more than that case? Oh yeah, I, I've seen it numerous times, and okay. you know, but not 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 always at the same time. It was rare to get it both eyes at the same time. I've often seen it where it's one eye one month, and then another eye six months later. Um, but you know, when the literature will show it's somewhere in the five percent range where people will have it in both eyes. Why that's the case? Why it's only unilateral? In ninety-five percent, that's totally unknown. It shouldn't be. I mean, the herpes simplex, it's in your whole body. It's got to be in both ganglia. Well, why does why it only come out in one eye? We don't know. And, and do you think there's a need for a systemic uh, workout, workup if there's a bilateral case for any... I, I, don't, I don't think so. Not, not, if, not if they're otherwise healthy and the review of systems is normal. So, Mr. President and uh, members governing members of the TNOA, I think I'll open up uh, uh, this session for your questions, if there are any, uh, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, talk today, uh, a complete overlap, uh, a complete overview. Of yeah. A very, very important topic, which every one of us are going to face in our practice. Uh, Dr. Yeah, 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 anybody, Sir, do you have any question? A big, uh, that was an amazing presentation, sir. We would like to thank you for that amazing presentation. And uh, most of the questions were covered by Prashna, sir. Just one question I would like to ask, sir. What about uh, what is the role for aqueous tap uh, for PCR? Oh, aqueous tap for PCR, I think it's I mean, helpful case, if you, if you, if you don't know you what think there is a concomitant infection. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's helpful for you know simplex zoster CMV. Um, so uh, we don't do it that often, but I think that if you have significant inflammation or you're not sure what's going on, it could be helpful. And you can get an answer pretty quickly. So, so simple so, question, uh, Dr. Chris. How long do you have to wait uh, for a cataract surgery and with the herpes or to get herpes? So um, it ought to be quiet for a minimum of three months, ideally six months before going mm -hmm. to cataract surgery. And okay. then they get extra steroids after to slow taper. Thank you. And with this prophylactic dose of 400 milligram BD, have you ever seen recurrence with that prophylactic dose, sir? Yes. Yeah, the head study showed 
that about 50% uh, would still recur at that dose. So, or 50% decrease. So yeah, absolutely. It can, it can definitely recur with that dose, um, but it definitely is less than if, you, if you're not on it. So uh, the case that Prajna sir was referring, the post graft, was that case on a prophylactic dose as well, sir? Yeah. The post graft recurrence. No, uh, I, I don't know. It was one of the uh, okay. questions. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sir. So yeah, it can still recur. I've had even after grafts are doing well, they're on 400 twice a day, they can still get recurrences. They tend to be less severe. Um, and more easily managed, um, but they can still get recurrences. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay, so definitely, so thank you, thank you. Uh, if you don't have any questions, then we can, uh, I think we have come to the end of the session. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Christopher Perno. I really, it's a, uh, wonderful talk for me. Uh, I never heard such a uh, talk on uh, herpes infections of the candy segment management. Really, is a lot of learning for us. Thank you once again. And uh, now I uh, request our uh, academic committee chairman, Dr. Ratik, to propose what up thanks. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, to begin with, uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, Ramakrishnan, sir, for having uh, thought of this uh, topic. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, sincere uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Rapuano. It was a one-of-a-kind uh, presentation. It was uh, absolutely mesmerizing uh, talk. I'm sure uh, that all our attendees had a lot of uh, take-home points from your message. And this video will be posted in our YouTube channel, and uh, I strongly feel uh, uh, this may have one of the highest views ever. And uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Prajna, sir, uh, for beautifully summarizing sir's talk and uh, for wonderfully uh, coordinating uh, the session and uh, for having got uh, Dr. Rapuano for our uh, TNOA uh, webinar. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to all the attendees for having uh, made this webinar a grand uh, success. Thank you so much. Never Thank you very much. It's been it's been an honor. It's been an honor to be here. Secretary, Dr. Thank, you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, yeah. I was five minutes late in joining, sir. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. We didn't see your face. <laughs> no, no, a special thanks okay, to Dr. Okay. Rapuano and uh, Prajna, sir. Thank you for that special touch <laughs> where you went back to a few points uh, to just re-emphasize certain things, which you would uh, which I've really appreciated in you right from my PG days. You always gone back to certain things to tell it twice so that it really stays in our minds. Thank you so much, Prajna, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Good you night. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.